This unit is about downsampling. Here we see again our VGG network architecture. As we've seen in the previous unit, convolution operations maintain the spatial resolution of the input. They leave it unaltered. However, downsampling operations such as max pooling, they reduce the spatial resolution, in this case here from 224 to 112. Downsampling operations are useful in convolutional networks to successively reduce the spatial resolution, for instance, in order to arrive at a single outcome, such as a label that describes the entire image, but also in order to successively aggregate more and more global information about the image by looking at larger and larger regions in the image. The downsampling, here these red operations, max pooling as one example, successively reduces the spatial resolution <clears throat> and at the same time increases the receptive field, increases the domain or the input region that influences a particular neuron. In the end, here, these neurons are influenced by each single pixel in the Im image here. While in the beginning, the first convolutional layers, <clears throat> only very local neighborhoods are influencing individual activations. One of the simplest and maybe most common downsampling operation is called pooling and there's different variants. Maximum pooling, minimum pooling, average or mean pooling, for instance. Pooling has no parameters. Pooling simply operates, it operates on each channel separately and takes a particular region in the in image that's defined by the pooling kernel. In this case here, in this example, it's three by three and takes the pooled value, for instance, the maximum in the case of maximum pooling, and puts that value at that lo output location here. And then it moves on with a certain stride. So it doesn't, it doesn't look at the direct neighboring pixel of the input, but it, it typically moves on with a certain stride. So it jumps over one input pixel here. In this case, the stride would have been two. And then again, it, it looks into this region defined by the kernel and maximizes all values and puts this maximal value at that location. And it does so as well for this location here of the output and this location here of the output. In this case, this is a max pooling operation that has a three by three kernel, but in practice often uh, kernels of size two by two that uh, with a stride of two that reduce the spatial dimension by two are common. If you have a stride of two, then you reduce the spatial dimension by roughly two. Here is the mathematical expression for this operation. So we have the tensor at the output tensor here at <clears throat> B and the spatial location X, Y. That is the maximum over all delta X, delta Y of the input tensor um, where we take the current location multiplied with the stride, typically two, plus delta X and S times Y plus delta Y. We maximize over delta X and delta Y. As you can see, there is no parameters. It's just a maximum operation. And it's applied to each channel separately. So we apply this separately to each input channel, which means that we um, keep the, well, we don't keep the spatial dimension, but we keep the um, number of the channels. So the number of the output channels is the same as the number of the input channels. So here is a concrete example where we have used a max pooling operation with stride two and kernel size two by two, which reduces the spatial dimension by a factor of two.
can see the red cell here that corresponds to these red input cells. The green cell corresponds to the green input cells and so forth. You can also see that um, we obtain a six here because six is the largest value amongst all values in the red input cells. Eight here is the largest value amongst all values in the corresponding green input cells and so forth. One little remark here is that max pooling provides some invariance to small translations of the inputs that has often been used as an argument of why max pooling is useful. But in, in practice, um, often today, um, people have replaced max pooling with what's called a strided convolution. Strided convolution is simply a standard convolution operator that has a stride in it. So this is an operation that, unlike max pooling, it has parameters um, in the same way as a convolutional layer has parameters. But you can reduce the spatial resolution without requiring additional type of pooling layer. It's a standard convolution with a stride. So here we have, this is the equation that you've seen before, the convolution. The only difference is now highlighted in red here that we have um, for the input x, y location, <clears throat> we query the input layer or the input tensor at stride times x plus delta x and stride times y plus delta y. So what we effectively do is that we move the convolution filter not by one pixel, but we move it by a stride of s with respect to the input tensor. Still, we have the same parameters A and B for the weights and the bias as we had before for the regular convolutional layer. And so this is a form of learned downsampling in contrast to max or mean pooling, which does not have any parameters and is not learned. And it's used in, in many modern network architectures such as ResNet, for instance. So finally, I um, want to briefly mention the notion of receptive field and also <clears throat> uh, show you a little bit the, the relationship between the size of, of the input and the output tensors. So receptive field is defined <clears throat> as all pixels in the input X that influence a particular neuron. Okay. So let's assume we have a two layer neural network like here, where we have a input X, this is the image that's input to the network, and we have two hidden layers. Maybe we have more hidden layers, but we're only interested in the second hidden layer here. And let's say we're interested in this neuron. If we wanna know which pixels have an effect on that neuron, <coughs> and if all of these two layers are using three by three convolutions, we can go backwards from that pixel and think about, well, which pixels or which spatial locations, which features in the first layer or feature map have an influence on that one. And clearly because we have a three by three convolution, all the features that are outside of that three by three convolution don't have an influence on that. So we have only this area here, which has an influence. Now we can apply the free by free kernel on all of these locations here. And we see that this is the area, in this case it's a five by five, where inputs have an influence on that neuron. Because for instance, for this pixel here, this pixel influences this feature here, and that feature here influences that neuron. And so the maximal area or the, the union of all pixels that have an influence on a particular neuron are called the receptive field of that neuron. This is what the, this particular neuron attends to, what this particular neuron is influenced by. That's called the receptive field. And of course, if you would add one more input layer before layer X, and you would see that the receptive field grows 
and it grows even larger, it grows even quicker if you use, for instance, a pooling operation, uh, as you have a stride that, that expands more quickly. So if you would want to shrink the spatial resolution of a um, 224 by 224 pixel image, in other words, using just convolution layers, you would be very slow. It would just be linear. But if you shrink with pooling, um, you're going much, much faster than linear. Okay. So here's some arithmetics. <clears throat> it's important when implementing convolutional neural networks to specify the correct number of um, channels and the correct spatial dimensions of each tensor. And those depend on the filter size and the size of the input tensor and the number of channels in the input tensor and the padding and the stride. So here we're only concerned now with the spatial dimensions. As the uh, channels, they can be chosen by um, the convolution operation in PyTorch. So if we want to calculate what is the output spatial dimension of the output tensor, then we see um, that this can be calculated with this expression here, where this um, operation here is the floor operation, the rounding operation. Okay, so let's have a, a closer look. So we have the width and the height dimension here. Both are almost the same. It's just like the W that changes to H. Um, and what we do here is we are adding to the input uh, twice uh, the padding because we do padding at both sides and then we subtract the kernel because the kernel shrinks again uh, the spatial dimensions and then we divide by the stride. If we have a stride of two then we reduce the output by approximately two. Now if this operation here is a fractional number then um, we need to round this uh, fractional number to the bottom because we can't, at the next step, we wouldn't be able to um, calculate the output because there is some inputs missing. And that's why there is this floor rounding operation around. And then we, we're adding um, one again um, here in the end um, to um, uh, complete this expression, All right? So here's an, a simple example um, for a simple operation that has all of these properties here are all of these um, parameters set in in some non-trivial way so we have a five times five dimensional input we have padding um, one and we have a stride of four and a kernel of a three by three so in this case if we go by a stride of four we move from here to there right this means that we cover the entire padded input which is good and so specification is proper and the output is just a two by two um, tensor, a tensor with spatial dimensions two by two. We can also plug in these values into this formula to see that this formula is correct. We have five <clears throat> plus two is seven, uh, minus three is four, divided by stride four is um, one, the rounding operation um, is not effective here. So we have one plus one is two. So the output is two by two. So this is an easy way of um, calculating the layer size when you develop these convolutional architectures. And, and finally, <clears throat> we uh, briefly talk about uh, the fully connected layers that are also part of this convolutional or some of uh, part of some of these convolutional network architectures. Fully connected layers are actually the most intensive, memory intensive, memory hungry part of convolutional network architectures because they are fully connected. So um, in this case here, we have 40, uh, like 4,096 neurons that are connected to um, 4,096 neurons in these layers here. 
Um, so this is very memory intensive compared to these convolution kernels that are relatively memory lightweight. <clears throat> Yet in this particular architecture, they have been found useful for achieving state-of-the-art performance. In order, in order to um, apply fully connected layers, we need to shrink the spatial dimensions for instance, from seven to seven, from from seven to seven, to one to one, <clears throat> from seven by seven to one by one. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we do that exactly the way how we shrunk the spatial dimensions of the MNIST digits to vectors in our MLP exercise. We simply flatten the inputs. So let's assume we have a feature map of size three by three with three channels. Then we reshape, we apply a simple reshape operation to go from the tensor with four dimensions to a tensor with two dimensions, where now <clears throat> the uh, channel dimension absorbs the width and the height dimension here. So we have now basically concatenated all of the um, features from each of the spatial locations here in one big vector. That's why um, here we have a one by one by 27 dimensional tensor, while here the input was a three by three by three dimensional tensor. So we just stack all these individual um, um, channels per pixel into a big vector. Right, and this is easily accomplished by a NumPy reshape operation. Now X and Y, the X and Y dimensions are reshaped into the feature channel dimension C. And uh, we can then apply a standard fully connected layer on this vector here, which in Einstein notation um, can be simply written as, as this one here. So we have the output tensor for batch B and channel C out is the activation of this linear operation here, where we sum over the input channels. Here is a example of what this looks like for a simple convolutional network to classify images. And I encourage you to have a look at this website here, which has a nice <coughs> Um, interactive demo that you can have a look at. So this is a network where you can see, so the first column here is a um, the output of the convolution layer before the activation. And then the second column, we see the activation. Then we have a second layer here with the output before and after the activation. And then we have a max pooling operation here, which you can see reduces the spatial resolution. Then there's again a convolution operation, another convolution operation, and another max pooling operation. Then there's another convolution operation, another convolution operation, these two columns, and another max pooling operation. And then finally a softmax to predict um, a discrete distribution over the outputs. You can see how successively features are becoming more and more coarse in spatial dimensions, but hopefully more and more expressive in feature channel dimension to finally predict the correct output. <clears throat>